Hello, this is Dr. Jeanette Raymond, psychologist, psychotherapist, relationship expert, and author of Now You Want Me, Now You Don't. I'm here today to talk to you about my series on couples communication issues. This is part seven, and we're going to talk about suspicion. So just imagine when your partner doesn't give you the complete information that you're asking for. Do you feel a little bit suspicious of their motives? Uh, do you think they're trying to hide something? Or if your partner apologizes for something, do you suspect that they're not being genuine? Are you suspicious that they are trying to manipulate or use you if they're nice to you or if they try to anticipate your needs that they're going to come in and then grab you for something else. It's very, very common in relationships and in marriage. So, um, as you can imagine, if both parties are suspicious of each other's motives and intentions, they don't trust each other, they don't believe in their sincerity and genuineness, it's going to make for difficult uh, connections, it's going to make for a lack of empathy, and most of all, it's going to prevent the emotional intimacy that's necessary for couples to bond and feel secure and safe in their journey forward as they create that couple connection separate from their personal individual lives. So let's talk again about our couple, Rachel and Byron, and I'm going to give you an example of how suspicion on both their parts uh, brought them into my therapy office. So um, Rachel was um, telling me about Byron offering to, uh, you know, take on some parenting duties while she was away at a conference related to her job. So she was going to be away like for three or four days. And uh, she told me that Byron said, yes, he'd take care of everything, laundry, school, clothes, lunches, you know, PTA stuff, whatever it was necessary he would do, not to worry that she could go to the conference uh, and uh, enjoy it and, and leave them to it. Well, she was suspicious. He didn't really believe him. She thought that he was going to uh, take her son to school late, that he would not really make good lunches. He'd just give him, you know, fast food, junk food, snacks, and not really bother making him wholesome sandwiches and giving him fruit and so on like she did. She also believed that he would let her son watch TV at night for as long as he wanted, would not push him to do his homework, would kind of just... Uh, be a very lenient parent and let him get away with everything just to be friends with their son so they would like each other and then when she came back she would have to play the bad cop to her husband's good cop role. So when her, when Byron was say, telling her that he would do all these things she had that kind of look on her face that I don't really believe you uh, but I don't want to attack you either because, you know, I don't have any proof yet, but I'm not really buying this. So imagine how Byron felt. He felt very aggrieved that he, his genuineness, his sincerity, his good intentions were being maligned before he even had a chance to prove it, that he was already being cast as a bad parent and as somebody who just said something uh, but had no intentions of keeping his word that basically his own wife didn't trust him to care enough about his son and do a good parenting job, i.e. her way, and that his way was automatically wrong. So he was aggrieved on many fronts, that she didn't, be that there was no trust, that he wasn't, uh, she didn't believe he could be a good parent, and that her way was automatically better than his way and if he did it his way she would have to pick up the pieces and he she'd have to come back to a bad situation so what do you think is going to happen when she actually leaves is he going to feel that he's got the confidence of his wife is he going to feel good about himself is he going to have a good self-image 
Is he going to want to take his parenting duties seriously? Is he going to want to prove her wrong? Is it going to become a battle? Well, it's a bit of each. So the whole time they're separate and they're maybe Skyping or texting or talking, there's this kind of undercurrent of, yeah, you say you've done this from Rachel's point, and, uh, but, you know, I don't really believe you. I'll have to come back and check it out. And, you know, a little bit of, have you done this? Have you done that? Checking up on him, undermining his, uh, ability to take care of things and to do it because he wants to, not because he has to prove something to his wife or to his son. So when she actually returns from her trip, she, instead of wanting to greet both of them uh, and say how much she missed them and enjoy the connection again and let them do the same, her eyes are all over looking for what was done and what was not done and checking with her son about whether daddy took him to school on time, what daddy gave him to eat at night, how long he stayed up, and then, you know, creating tension between herself and Byron and also putting her son in a bad place of having to tell tales on daddy or take sides. So all in all, suspicion is a very negative and destructive force in the relationship. And of course, Byron is also not immune from being suspicious himself. So one time in my therapy office, Rachel told him that, you know, after talking with me and understanding uh, what was going on for her, she apologized to him for not listening and for presuming things about her, making assumptions that, you know, she had no right to make and that she wasn't going to do it again. She was going to be more careful. She was going to be a more attentive listener and so on. Well, he just looked at her and he went, you know, like, oh, yeah, you say it now, but I know you're not going to do it. I know you're just saying it because you're in Dr. Raymond's office and that's what you're supposed to say. I don't believe that you're really sorry. I don't believe you're contrite. I don't believe you've learned any lesson. You're just going to do it again. And you're just trying to make me soften me up so that I lower my guard again. So Rachel then felt completely uh, unseen and unrecognized that this very difficult effort that she put in to try and truly apologize and say that she was seeing what she did wrong, that she would, knows now why it was wrong and what effect it had on him, that she wanted to change, she wanted to get closer with him. He just dismissed it with a shrug of the shoulders and making her feel that nothing she could do would make him feel better, would make him accept her apology and would make him trust her again. So once again, their whole dynamic, the interaction between them, is full of suspicion. They suspect each other's intentions, motives, apologies, um, or you know that their requests of each other, their expectations. Nothing is taken at face value, and nothing is seen as coming from a good place. So if both Byron and Rachel are imagining that everything each other says is coming from a place of condemnation, of criticism, of judgment, of lack of uh, belief in them, of no faith in them. They're not going to be able to be good partners because they are always trying to prove that they're not all these bad things that they're being made out to be. And they're battling against this barrage of uh, destructive criticism and judgment that they're trying to keep their head above water and just breathe as human beings. So the couple connection has no shape, it has no mold, it has no structure, it has no home in which to live. So it's going to fall apart. This is how I helped Rachel and Byron in my therapy office when I saw this pattern going on week after week. So one time when Rachel was being genuine and offering her apology and saying that she, re she realized that she wasn't a good listener, that she often cut Byron off, that she often presumed things about him, I made her uh, hang on and say, wait, don't tell him anymore. I asked Byron to face her 
and look at her body language. Look at her eyes, listen to the tone of her voice, look at her facial muscles, look at her body posture, look at her hands, look at her eye contact. Forget the words she's using. Does that and look and see what that tells you. Is it coming from a sincere place? Never mind the words, because the words get in the way. He'd heard it so many times before, he never bothered to look at all the other signs, that she really was meaning sincerely what she said, and she wanted a second chance. She wanted to start over. This time, he paid attention, and mind you, it took a few times. He wasn't, you know, going to buy it and swallow it right away, and you can understand why when he's heard this before and not felt that it was genuine. So I trained him, I taught him to listen to the tone of her voice, the way she spoke, her eye contact, the facial muscles, the hand gestures, the way she, her body posture was towards him, not away from him, that she wasn't just trying to get it over with. She, there was tears in her eyes, that there was a softer, gentler tone in, in her voice. All those things, I helped him focus in and absorb them and take a chance and say, okay, uh, what have you learned? You know, here's how I feel when you make assumptions about me and when you don't trust me and you make me feel so bad, I don't want to trust you either. So, you know, I was able to show Byron that he was doing to her in that moment what he felt she did to him, which is ignore her sincerity by dismissing her before she could even get going. And over the weeks and months, he learned how to do that. And they learned to be more open with each other and give each other a chance. From Rachel's point of view, I asked her to listen to what Byron had to say about taking his duty seriously as a father, as a partner, and doing the jobs that he said he wanted to do and that he looked forward to doing for the family, for her, and for his son. And not to make any comments, to maybe think them in her head, but not to say them out loud. Maybe to write them down just to get them out of her system. And then make room for the fact that there was a possibility he could do these things. And then in that moment, I asked her to recall out loud in front of Byron all the things that she could recall that Byron did in the last two days that were positive that were trustworthy and that were productive for the family. You know what? She had a really hard time. So I asked Byron to tell them a few and she started to cry. She just didn't see it that way until I trained her to look for these things, to look for the time when she was home late and he cooked by his son a meal from scratch. They did it together with whatever was in the fridge. He didn't get angry when she came home late, he fed his son. They enjoyed cooking together. There was another time when he remembered that she had to uh, do something for her parents that she forgot, pick up something, you know, take her mother to the doctor. And he remembered and he called her and he said, don't worry about it. I'm going to put Nathan, our son, into the car, jump in, get your mom and we'll take her to a doctor's appointment. Don't worry about it. So there were little things like that that she had not taken into account because it wasn't on her radar. Similarly with Byron, he had not seen his wife as genuine because he wasn't looking at her body language and taking all that into account. So I helped them to refocus. I trained them to see things that they were previously blind to. And I enabled them to connect without so much suspicion. I helped them to build bridges of trust that made them feel more loving towards each other, more eager to share their lives with one another instead of just trying to keep safe or play the battle game. And you can do the same if you follow my ideas and take Byron and Rachel's example. Please take a moment and let me know your responses to this video. If you've had any experiences of being suspicious of your partner being suspicious of you and preventing the connection, I'd love to hear from you and I'd be happy to answer your questions.